It's the Satan becomes the term for our collective spiritual darkness. Spiritual warfare today on In the Shadow of the Cross. Shadow of the Cross. I am Lauren Rosser, and I'm here once again with my friends Jim Durkin, Harry, and Indiana Jones. <laughs> so, yes, uh, that that is his selected sign-in name for this week. But it's Michael Harden, and uh, today we thought it would be cool to talk about spiritual warfare. This was a hot topic when I was a teenager, um, as, when I was involved in youth group and stuff. This had great interest. There were there were there were books that came out like there was the um, there was the fiction book, uh, This Present Darkness, that was very popular at that time by Frank Peretti. And that sparked a lot of interest in spiritual warfare among the evangelical youth like me back at the time. Um, and it was a, a hotly talked about topic among youth leaders. And then all the way into the 90s, when I even became a youth pastor, this was a topic we talked about. Um, But I have to say, my views on it have shifted a lot, at least my understanding of it, I should say, has shifted a lot. But also a lot of it isn't yet fully developed. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation, um, because I've actually not had a conversation on spiritual warfare in like decades, really. Um, so this, this will be, this will be a fun one. Um, so what do you guys think when, when I was younger and it was being taught, you know, it was like almost like science fiction, you know, you had angels flying around and demons flying around there and battles in the sky that we can't see. And, you know, um, it was a little bit like the matrix and all, all kinds of, you know, so of course the fiction was really gr- drew us in as, as young people, but, uh, what is spiritual warfare? So much like you, Lauren, I think my first um, real perspective uh, on on spiritual warfare uh, came in the uh, early 80s when um, the idea was taken from uh, the Old Testament, uh, really, where the prophet was praying, uh, you know, and finally, uh, you know, the angel breaks through and tells them, well, you know, since the first day that you were praying, you know, you you were heard, but the Prince of Persia has resisted me, and and now when I, I have to get back to the battle because, you know, and, and so then you have movies that come out with, you know, the good angels fighting the bad angels and all that, and, and uh, so what came out of that uh, concept or that that understanding or perspective, however you want to say it, was uh, something that was called spiritual mapping. And so we would pray over, uh, you know, an area, a geographical area, and try and identify the principality that's over that area. And at the time I was pastoring in New York, so it was it was kind of fun. There was a group that was actually um, had an office in the Empire State Building, and their spiritual mapping was literally mapping by city block. And they identified a principality over these five city blocks and then a different principality over this territory. And and so they, so their spiritual warfare was to you know, the weapons of warfare are not carnal, they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So some of those areas, the principality was a stronghold. And others of those areas that weren't really a stronghold, it was just kind of a mindset that kind of dominated that. And and all of, all, all of this, so you had to know who the principality was over it, who the stronghold was over it, who the, you know, the mindset, and and then you could pray against it. But but if you didn't know what they were, you were like Paul says in one place, you know, that he was just like beating the air, you know. And uh, so we need 
to un- have understanding to target the principalities and and it wasn't long I, I i had a kind of a strange feeling in in my gut about that it's like this seems kind of weird it really seems like it gives more focus to the enemy than it does to god and then i read that um uh, the enemy was defeated. <laughs> I read that um, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and far above principalities and powers. And then I read that we're also seated in that same place with Christ in heavenly places. And, and well, if, if heavenly places are far above principalities and if the enemy is defeated, And if I'm seated in that same place, then I must also be far above principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and high places and and all of that. And so then I went all the way over to the other side that, well, there must not be anything called spiritual warfare. I'm more than a conqueror. And I, I, I went all the way over to that side where nothing can touch me because I'm hidden in Christ, you know. And so when things happened in my life, it was like, well, this isn't spiritual warfare because the enemy can't even, this is just life. Uh, Life took a couple of interesting turns (laughs) that then I began to start thinking, well, maybe this isn't just life. Maybe this is something else. And uh, so I began to modify some of my, my beliefs about uh, spiritual warfare, and I, in modifying them, I think I'm kind of like you, Lauren. I haven't drawn any positive conclusions. I'm not prepared to say that every single thing that happens to me is, you know, an attack from the devil. I'm, I'm certainly not prepared to say that uh, there are principalities that rule over territories that I have to tear down, and. Yet I'm also not prepared to say that, uh, oh, there's no such thing as spiritual warfare. It's like I'm I'm the victor. I'm the, you know, and uh, so I'm I'm kind of like you. I'm interested in this topic. I'm interested in discussing it with the two of you. And let's just see where we go from there. It's interesting, Jim, because you your experience um, uh, resembles some of mine during um, during my early years in, in my twenties, especially. Um, I got really involved in uh, what what Lily and I call a charismania, you know, where it, <laughs> it wasn't just charismatic, you know, believing in the gifts. Where it's like you go kind of crazy, you know, a little bit with some of this stuff. And, and, uh, I, I remember being in, uh, worship services where guest prophets would come in and they would talk about their holding worship services in the middle of the Gobi desert to bring down the strongholds that are there. And, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was like, um, it, now I kind of go, wouldn't it been better to maybe go feed the hungry or, you know, spend the money on something like that. But, but it's like, So there was that. And then we got caught up in so much of the same types of things you're talking about. Spiritual mapping was, I'd heard of it, but I'm familiar with it. It was just not something we ever got caught up into, but we were very much, what's the principality over the city? Oh, we see this thing. And, um, and yeah, we, we kind of, as I grew and got and started getting untangled from religion and, and started discovering the love of God, that all that kind of thinking fell by the wayside. Um, and it wasn't even like, this is junk. I'm just getting rid of it. It just kind of fell off like, like an old shoe, you know, you just don't need it anymore. Um, and what I'm, what I'm finding interesting and, and then getting a hold of Michael's book, my whole view of what principalities and powers are completely changed, you know, um, which I'm hoping he'll, I'm sure he'll expand on, on some of what his writings were on that topic. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting, though, like you said, Jim, though, about you go to the other extreme where it's non it's like non-existent. But then I encountered some moments on various um, projects I was working on and stuff like I was working on that video series with Steve Crosby. And then you, I encountered certain situations where there was clearly resistance, where it, mm-hmm. it wasn't like 
it, it wasn't like, oh, you know, there's a devil behind every bush or I, you know, I'm having a bad day or, you know, something like that. It was like it, it, certain things would start happening so many times that it became like, okay, this is weird, you know? And so I would reach out to, to Steve and the other people I said and say, hey, you know, can you pray for me? Something's going on here, you know? Um, so, but, but I, other than that, I don't know a whole, you know, a, a lot about the whole topic of spiritual warfare, but, but I, I do think that there is resistance that we encounter um, from time to time, but I certainly am not the devil behind every bush and every bad thing that happens to me. My car broke down. It's a demon. You know, I'm sick today. It's a demon. You know, I, I certainly don't think that. Um, but I have seen also at the same time, like how we ended up in Milwaukee. It's kind of interesting because Lily and I going through a season, a, a, a rough spell, me at my job and everything. And we started praying. And when we started praying, things got worse. But it was the father allowing things to get worse to get us discom- uncomfortable because <laughs> we had to make a change. And, mm-hmm. and so there's definitely something that happens in, in the spiritual world that if we're just apathetic, there are things that don't happen that should happen. And then I think also if we're apathetic, there are things that, that are happening that shouldn't be happening. Um, so... What do you guys think? Um, let, I'll just open it back up and, and throw it over to you, Michael. What are your thoughts? Well, so um, I, I, as, as you know, Lauren, I mean, I have a, a little ebook of about 50, 60 pages on the Satan. And I also um, co authored with Walter Wink in the um, Understanding Spiritual Warfare Four Views volume. And um, so here's, here's the thing is that. Let's just take our contemporary American Protestant Christianity. Two sides. Those that affirm a personal devil and those that have no supernatural at all. Your liberal progressives, their concept of the supernatural is more, uh, it's, it's flaky, it's wishy-washy. You know what I mean? But the, the, the more, the people who believe in a personal devil, so misunderstand this this a a the the category of the devil or satan two the nature of spiritual reality and three where it takes place okay so i mean i i didn't laugh or anything when you talked about the spiritual mapping and stuff but i i i remember in in the book that uh is has the four views um, Peter Wagner and Rebecca Greenwood wrote an essay in here. And um, as you know, both Wagner and Greenwood are real big, you know, on on uh, this spiritual mapping stuff. And yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to be crude. I'm really not. But when I read that article by Wagner and Greenwood, I could not help it. I, I felt like I had to, to like destroy them like they were the principalities and powers, you know? Uh, and um, so, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge because there's so much to rethink. So let's, let's start off by acknowledging the um, category of the devil uh, has been um, of interest to scholars now for about 30 years. And so there's some fantastic histories or biographies of Satan, as it were, that trace out the origins of the category uh, to Zoroaster in Persia, about 800 years before Jesus, uh, carried on through into Second Temple Judaism and the way that the, this devil figure energy, whatever you want to call it, it's a god. In, in Zoroastrianism, there are two gods. One is good, one is evil. They're equal, and, and everything's yin and yang and balance, you know, and okay. Um, it gets transmuted into a uh, an angelic figure um, in the Jewish tradition, and the Satan uh, you know, has access to the courts of God in the book of Job and in the book of Zechariah, you know. And um, and then in apocalyptic literature, like First Enoch is where we have developed the whole myth of the watchers 
of the battle in heaven and all that. That's where that comes from is First Enoch. It's not in Scripture, and you cannot find it in Isaiah 14. Forget about it. It's just not there. The, the concept wasn't there at the time Isaiah is writing. You know what I mean? So you can't make it happen there. Um, and then, of course, by the time we get to the New Testament, uh, it seems pretty clear that Jesus engages this Satan figure. Okay? Now, how he engages it and how he defines it are very different than the Christians think. And then, of course, we move on through through the uh, Middle Ages, where the Satan becomes Lucifer, and um, you know the the light bearer that fell. You know, and then we we end up with just incredible amounts of superstition being attached. And we move to the Enlightenment, and in the Enlightenment, the Satan figure takes a turn and becomes Mephistopheles, the thinker. Huh, and, interesting. Yeah, so if, you re- if you've ever read uh, Goethe's uh, poem Faust, uh, in there, uh, it's the devil having a conversation with Faust. And the devil says, look, why don't you just go translate the opening verses of the Gospel of John? And Dr. Faust sits down and he tries to translate. And he gets to, in the beginning was the Logos. Logos? What's, lo- what's a Logos? And, you know, you can't put deed, act thought, idea. I mean, there's so many, you know, he struggles trying to, to, to translate this, but the Mephistopheles figure is, is now this one who questions religion, who questions, is, he's the true ultimate postmodernist back in 1800, right? And um, everything, you know, just was flowing smoothly along. The church was, was doing her, her basic, um, uh, nonsense. And then, of course, when the Pentecostal tradition arose and the charismatic movement arose post 50s, the entire charismatic movement is built on pure speculation. So we, we really do need to suss out biblically how does the scripture handle the Satan? Uh, how did Jesus understand it? You know, what was, what was Paul talking about when he talks about principalities and powers? Then we also have to recognize that, um, as both of you have articulated so well, there is something, there is a reality um, that can tap into us and we can tap into. I, I think it's, it's, it's much better if we, uh, A, don't personalize the devil. He's not a, he's not a person. He's not a, you know, he doesn't have like consciousness and, hey, my name is Satan, but you can call me the devil, you know? I mean, th- we, we need to start thinking bigger picture. So we have to ask, where does this dark side come from? So we're talking about the origins of the Satan now. Well, you know, the, the Zoroastrian, type traditions, they, the Satan and, and the good and bad gods have always been there from eternity. So evil is kind of like built into the universe. Then there's the Jewish uh, view uh, that the devil is um, created by God. God creates everything good. And then somehow evil enters the world. Now, when you go to the book of Genesis, there's the, the Torah and you're reading chapter three, there's not a devil figure there. That's more of a Mephistopheles type figure. Hey, did God really say, you know, you can't, you can't do that, right? But it's not a devil figure, okay? It's just this talking snake. It's so um, to, to use the Genesis 3 text as though it's talking about a devil or a Satan would be false unless you included Genesis 4 which does not talk about the devil, but it does talk about sin, standing outside the door, crouching. And the reason I say this is because when Jesus identified the characteristics of evil, he identified two phenomena, lies and deception and death, murder. Those two things go hand in hand. And so you can't, you can't just say the devil's in chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned, and then move on as though the killing of Abel means nothing, right? You have to keep them together. 
Um, these are just some initial thoughts that might spark further conversation. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting because it um, it, it does tear down a lot of the um, like you talked about the the um, view of a personal devil. You know, uh, like you said, like the TV series Lucifer. You know, he shows up. Hey, I'm I'm here. You know. Um, so it, it's interesting. That's probably a concept a lot of people haven't, especially on the evangelical side, haven't really thought about as far as him not being not being this actual dude who's walking around, but but mm-hmm. something something different, still something very dark, but something different than that than that concept. Uh, Jim, what what are your thoughts? Do I go there? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you go where? As as a charismatic. Oh, okay. I, you know, I didn't mean to ditch your tradition, Jim. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I it's apologize. all right. I, it wasn't it's meant, all right. It's a um, blanket. Should have been I was going to yell at you after we stop recording, but it's it's okay, Michael. I'm I I'm I'm a big boy. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I, what I was going to say is, as a charismatic, so many traditions that we've been taught. As I research, but but in reality, as I just read the, the Bible, I begin to see I can't find enough substance, you know, to anchor these traditions into what, what I'm seeing just in reading the Bible. And it's interesting. We talked about uh, sin a few weeks ago, and uh, you brought us to uh, Genesis 4, the first mention of sin. Mm-hmm. And since then, I've been I've been really considering it, and that's one of the reasons why I appreciate that we're talking about spiritual warfare today. I'm not uh, I'm not there yet. I'm not. I may get there. I may not get there. That that Satan is not a personality, but that's not the issue. The issue is if he is, is that any different than if he isn't? if we really understand who Satan or the Satan is and what he does. And so we have things that, uh, for instance, uh, I've come to the, the emphasis that when Jesus was being tempted, what was being torn down was his God given identity. Paul talks in one place and he says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the spiritual realm. And I think about that. What what does, what is the biggest opposition that comes against a man or a woman of God from other people? It's attacking who they are in God. Mm-hmm. Who their their identity their in God identity. I'm not talking mm-hmm. about in ministry identity. I'm talking about mm-hmm. in God identity. Okay, in Christ. And Paul's saying, look, you need to understand that that's not people resisting you. That's a that's a spiritual thing. There, there's where the real warfare lies. Our wrestling is against spiritual entities, and whether they're physical entities walking around, I, 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 I don't give them human uh, attributes, you know. Um, I, I kind of tend to, to agree that they're much more spiritual than they are physical. Let's put it that way. And, and what's called demon possession or things of that nature, um, I don't even speculate on those levels. But I do, I do see the connection that you're bringing out to tie Genesis three to Genesis four. That makes a lot of sense to me, and and I think if we don't tie it together, I think we miss a whole area here where we're giving Satan a, a, um, way too much authority, if if you will. Uh, he can he can puncture my tires. Uh, he can make a check uh, for my mortgage payment. Get to the bank late. He can you know he he can do all this stuff you know, and uh, 
and and in reality, I think where where I see sin and where I see the work of of uh, I'm I'm just going to say the enemy, okay, the spiritual enemy, where I see that work is to take me out of being in Christ, where my identity is an is an in God identity, um, and when I think I'm. Uh, no longer in Christ, or or I doubt that, or I question that. All I have left is being in me, and that's a hard road to hoe. <laughs> okay, it's just doing it in my in my own, uh, you know, uh, natural ability, doing life. Um, dare I say it? Life sucks. Uh, you know. It's like that's that's the bottom line, and uh, that's with or without the the Satan, as Michael would say. So, yeah, but I I see the correlation, and I I, I appreciate it. Yeah, we we also need to recognize that the satanic and the psychological. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The spiritual, the spiritual and the psychological are two sides of a coin. Hmm. Okay. That. So I'll, I'll just I'll just throw out some propositions, things that I believe. First of all, um, we humans um, are the Satan. Get thee behind me, Peter. That's not what he said. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. We human, and Peter wasn't like possessed by the devil for an instant. What was Peter's issue? Why did Jesus call him the Satan? Because Peter wanted a, a, a Davidic warrior Messiah, somebody to go out and kill in the name of God, mm-hmm. and. And again, Jesus is nonviolent. He talks all that. And, and his the whole thing about Jesus' view of the devil is that Jesus views this category of the satanic as purely anthropological. I mean, it's the, the devil is not a theological category. The devil is an anthropological category. And Jesus even shows that when he says, look, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. The, the devil it no longer exists in theology. It's not, it's not, he's not saying, oh, I was there in the beginning when the armies of the devils, when they were all fighting and I, I saw Satan fall. No, he's not talking about the Enoch myth. Jesus never references the Enoch myth, you know? And um, he's, he's, he's taking this devil and he's saying, don't, don't put your devil idea up there with God. It doesn't belong there. You are the devils. You are, you, and so it's the Satan becomes the term for our collective spiritual darkness. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and again, this is both on the, now we haven't defined terms yet, but it's both on the level of the spirit and the human suke, soul, psychology. Okay. The, they bleed the spirit and the and the psyche back and forth into each other. Okay, so can you can you uh, bring or manifest darkness in your life? Sure, you can. You you keep grudges. You you get angry of a temper. You you're bitter. You're hurt. Um, you you just have negative thoughts running through your head all day. Uh, you know. You you are you are in spiritual darkness at that point. You are you, you are in a battle that you're losing most of the time, right? So for me, spiritual warfare is something I am engaged in all day long, all day long by by retraining the negativity out of my head. I have to get it out of my head, you know. And, and as I do that, um, I discover that the light or the angels, whatever, uh, they are much more present and affect me than, than the, the dark side. Now, in Walking with Grandfather, my, the book about my Native American shamanic journey, um, part of sh- shamanic training you don't only learn how to do the the healing, the good things, but you also learn about the dark side, um, because it is real. 
We, we created it and it is a super power to us because we non-consciously are tapping into it all the time. So I think with what you're saying, a lot of people listening, their first thought is going to be, how, how does this play into the stories we read about Jesus casting out demons? Uh-huh. So, so there, again, uh, it's, it's really important to note a couple of things. Whenever Jesus heals somebody or casts a demon out of someone, it's so they can participate in community life again. A leper can't participate in community life. A woman with a hemorrhage can't participate in community life, right? Um, so when, when they're healed, they're restored to community, okay? So that's the first thing we have to recognize. The, the best example of a demoniac is the Gerasene demoniac, and Rene Girard has a most brilliant analysis of that pericope in his book, um, The Scapegoat. But in that story, the Gerasene demoniac is the scapegoat of the community, and he, he lives among the tombs, he's death, and he, he cuts himself, right? He's the epitome of, of, say, the youngest child in a family system that gets no attention, no respect, you know, and uh, is made fun of. They don't get to do anything that bigger brother and sisters get to do. And so they turn to hurting themselves, right? It's like that song says, um, uh, you, you bleed just to know you're alive. Just to, you, you cut yourself to feel pain because your feelings are completely numb, right? And so, um, again, there's that spirit psyche thing going on. The demoniac in the story has taken the word of the community that he's horrid, and he's believed it. He believed what the community said about him. He's the, in that sense, he's the myth, the victim of myth. He buys, or he's like um, the victim of myth in Joshua 7, Achan. He buys into his, he's responsible. And when Jesus comes and sets him free, Jesus is saying, you're not responsible for the dysfunctional community. You're not responsible for that, for everything they're putting on your shoulders. And when he's restored, the community has no scapegoat now. That means you're going to have to come up with another one. And guess everybody's invited to be a part of that, right? And, you know, it's like that Shirley Jackson novel, um, The Lottery, right? You, you know, There's 15 people in a room. One of you has got to be a scapegoat. It's totally random. So that's number one. Number two, some of those demonic stories uh, can easily be read as healing narratives. Uh, the boy with epilepsy, the father thinks he's got a demon, it's just epilepsy. You know, things like that. Um, there, there are certainly, there's nothing like in the movie The Exorcist or anything like that, you know. That, that's medieval stuff. That's medieval stuff. And the Catholic priests, the, the very few Catholic priests that actually do exorcisms will tell you that 99% of the cases that they actually examine are just psychological or psychiatric. They need medicine. And it's very, very few times these guys actually have to go in and do battle with darkness. So, so there is, you know, it, it exists, it's there, but it's not, it's not the way the church thinks. What, how, do, how does the, the pigs play into that story? You know, the, the demons going into the pigs and the pigs going off the cliff. Um, how, how does that work into that as far as the yeah, scapegoat? So, <laughs> so the, 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 the darkness knows it has to go somewhere, right? And uh, it's, it is, again, I'm, I don't know whether or not a story like that actually happened. I, I really don't. It could be created by the early church. I don't know. It could could have, something could have happened. Somebody saw something. Whatever. But in the narrative, in the story, it's the demons who say, "Hey, you, you got to send us somewhere. So send us into this herd of pigs, right?" And what do all the pigs do? They go commit suicide. Which is what the guy was trying to do, right? In a sense. The pigs completed the task. These unclean animals completed the demonic task of death. 
Now, now where are the demons? Do they all of a sudden, the pigs die and the demons go free and they get to go float around everywhere again? No, they, they too, quote, unquote, die, right? It's the end of this. It's the end of, of this thinking. So the, the notion that there are demons out there floating around trying to get us is absurd. It's just patently absurd. On the other hand, there are um, f- forces, I guess I would use that word, forces. I don't want to attribute personality to this, okay? Um, personality is interdividual. Uh, the, the darkness, the demonic it is highly individualistic, egoistic. It, 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 it's just, it's just sees itself. It doesn't see relationships. And this is the, this is the beautiful thing that it somehow works itself out. Evil can't cooperate with it. It can't cooperate because somebody always has to be on top, you know, and that's why two people that are both dark, they can hatch a plan together, but you can bet they're both thinking of a way to get the other out of, you know. Huh. Uh, it's the Sith from Star Wars. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. All it's right. interesting because, you know, the rule of two, and but one's always trying to overthrow the other. Ah, okay. I don't, I don't follow Star Wars. I apologize, Lauren. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. I just thought it was funny that I never knew, that, you know, that there was a correlation there. Uh, so, Jim, you seem like I, I could see the yeah, wheels turning I, I, in your head. Yeah, I'm thinking of, of uh, I, I do this a lot. Um, I, I weave scriptures together, and sometimes I come up with the right conclusion, and sometimes I don't. But as you're, as you're talking, Michael, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm weaving a few scriptures together, and, uh, and I'm going to start with one that he's the, the God of this world, I'm taking the the word world to mean the system, the world system, whatever. I'm uh, taking the next scripture, says to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, and, and, And in weaving that, I've always taught that, um, there is a system, if you will, there is a way of thinking, and that way of thinking, uh, possibly or, or probably, even in 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 how I've seen it, um, the core belief of that way of thinking is I'm I am the center of my world, and so everything revolves around me, and it all has to fit into my world view. Mm-hmm. And if you don't agree with my worldview, uh, then you're just, uh, you know, you're stupid, uh, you know, you're delusional, you're wrong, or maybe you're even demonized, <laughs> you know, if you don't agree with me. And and that's part and parcel of the whole worldview. Every person mm-hmm. is walking around in that. And, and go back then to the first one, that he's the god of that worldview. He orchestrates that evil is that way of thinking, that God's view is sacrificial. God's view is, as we've said in almost every podcast, nonviolent. But God's view is the view of a servant. The view of giving to one another, esteeming one another as better than myself, and so on and so forth. But the world's view is, no, I'm number one, mm-hmm. and everybody has to serve me. And so when you resist me, then I immediately have to come up with ways to, uh, you know, to resist you. It's like, you know fight on and uh you know and and that whole concept of fight on uh whether it's uh uh just in my thoughts as you said i feel bad about you i'm angry with you uh, you know i'm bitter towards you i'm trying to figure out how to get back at you 
or mm -hmm. it's full blown fisticuffs, if you, if you will, or mm -hmm. anything in between. Is is really this world's view mm -hmm. that Scripture tells me it takes the transforming of my mind yeah. to come out from under that world view. Yeah. And to that degree, I am being demonized, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. I'm giving in to the God of this world. Right. And uh, I'm told by Scripture to come out from among her and be separate, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. So that's, as as we're talking there, that's my weaving of a few Scriptures. Uh, and I know I cherry-picked them out of context. I get that. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I weave it to kind of come up with um, a concept that it isn't. I've never thought in terms of Satan as not being a being, but then I also have never attributed, or at least for many years, never attributed them the attributes of a being. Um, so, but I I do see it as more of a um, what's the word I'm fishing for? Concept or a, a, a process of thought life, uh, a, a value that I place on myself. It's, it's, it's kind of a combination of all of that. Um, would that be getting closer to what you're saying there, Michael, or yeah, yeah, how do you I, I see think, that? Uh, I, I think so. I, I was looking for something that I, that I, I had written to answer your question. Um, it's in the, the ebook, the Satan, which is also found in what the Facebook and, um, the, the, it's the, the fourth of 19 kind of little chapters. And I talk in that, the, the point I made earlier, I talk about our concept of personhood has to change. So as long as we think in terms of individuality, we're going to have an individual concept of person and this, thus we define God that way. Okay. If we have an individual view where Michael doesn't exist, Jim doesn't exist, but the Michael-Jim relationship exists, we are our relationships, right? Okay. We are from birth till, till everything else. I mean, till we die, we are our relationships. So I talked about Girard's individuality, and then this is what I, I wrote. Um, the Satan is corrupted mimetic desire. We're going to learn it by imitating. We learn by imitating. But it gets corrupted because we actually think the desire comes from our self, our, our individual egos. So I wrote, for most people, this is a huge shift. For many, it will be troublesome. However, I would rather have a definition of person that has grounding in scientifically demonstrable psychology than just speculation. So as we consider what it means for the Satan to be a person, it's important to remember that our worldviews will determine how we understand this and what we bring to the table. Would you rather just speculate as to what a person is? Or would you rather take advantage of all the wealth of accumulated science that's helped us to see ourselves not as islands in an ocean, but as part of an interconnected reality? So I, I'm, I, what I'm trying to just help people understand is that um, there is not, there is not um, some entities out there and they decide, well, it's Michael's turn today. We're going to go get him and it's Jim's turn tomorrow. And we're going to book Lauren for the full weekend. You know, <laughs> no, no, that's not how it works. It's the satanic in me, right? It's, it's me recognizing my negativity. It's me recognizing my negative thoughts. It's me recognizing uh, my corrupted mimetic desire. You know, y you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then, and then trying to force life. You can't do that. You just, the, the, and that's why pe there, people don't quote win spiritual battles. I mean, it's mm -hmm. easy to claim victory because you're praying over a city 
you know, and, and your political party gets their, the mayor elected and they change the laws to fit your way of thinking, like you said earlier, Jim. And now everybody goes, oh, see, we got victory. It's spiritual victory. Bullshit. Pardon me. But that's just nonsense, you know. Um, the notion, the, the idea that, that the satanic is geographic is absurd. It's absurd. Because first of all, even though the, this, when the scriptures talk about groups, communities, and nations, there is a, a spirit to that group, right? We, the three of us right now, we, ha we share a spirit, right? right? Remove one of us and the spirit changes. Add a fourth person, the spirit sure. changes. Okay. Sure. Sure. And we talk about school spirit, mob spirit, you know. National you, pride, work right. culture. You're right, but here's the deal: is that um, we are we are most caught up in dark, the demonic and darkness when we affirm or believe negative, dark things about the Father or about ourselves. Those are the two places in which all everything comes from. But battle, 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 always. I, I, I find this topic fascinating. And here's the thing is I, there was a specific reason why I was asking the story about the pigs and stuff. It, was, it, uh, it wasn't just because I'm trying to get information. Um, I, I was debating if I wanted to share this. And I'm going to go ahead and do it because we, we've shared out there stuff before. And so um, I had an interesting experience that, that you actually helped answer what I saw there, Michael, when, when you shared with the pigs that what was in the, the scapegoating mechanism going on, going outside of the, leaving the individual. Um, my best friend and I growing up, um, I, I, my friend Andy, we were friends since he was two and I was three. Mm -hmm. And he, he eventually was uh, the best man in my wedding. I mean, we we were friends for years and years, you know, those, how, just like in that movie, Stand By Me, how they say uh -huh. you never have friends like you had when you were 11. Right. Um, I, now, our parents were both Christians, but my mom, an incident occurred, and it wasn't even a major incident between the two mothers, right. and my mom did not like his mom, um, and she was very bitter towards her, and so therefore she kind of directed it towards my friend Andy, you know, w was very down about him spending the night, things like that, were other friends that came over, she had no problem with them spending the night, all that. that this is backstory important for what I'm about to share. Um, so... My friend Andy and I were going along fine. Then around 12 years old, we go through this week where we are just arguing bitterly, constantly, and, and for like a couple weeks. And our friendship is like hanging by a thread. It, it looks like it's going to end. This is going to be it. It's done. And we both grew up in church in Sunday school. I knew nothing about spiritual warfare. Didn't know any of that. None of it's Frank Peretti. Didn't write his book yet. None of that. Um, all I knew was the story of where uh, Peter and uh, had cast out a demon, you know, or where where they cast out demons. Um, I, I knew those stories from from Sunday school. Well, we're in the garage and we're having this huge argument, and it's just escalating, and it looks like it's done. And out of nowhere, I just shout out, "Satan, you're trying to destroy our friendship. It ain't gonna work in Jesus' name." <laughs> just what I knew from you know from what yeah, yeah. I'd read in the stories. At that moment, all the, sh all the, the we had like the rake, a, a, sh a shovel, a hoe on my dad's um, holder in the garage. They all fell off the shelf. And then outside, we could hear the trash cans rattle and then the gate like rattling. And we both looked at each other and just went, whoa. <laughs> and, 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 and we were like, what was that? Did, did, it was like, did we just see what we just thought we saw you know and then it was weird because then we just went well what do you want to do and we decided to go play and we didn't have issues again until high school when mimetic theory kept it came in and we liked the same girl yeah. <laughs> so so, so, so what, I, what, what did you actually do you you took that that feeling of a of a, of a, of a hurting relationship you knew you didn't want to be part of it right you yeah. knew it wasn't beneficial. So you used your metaphoric world, that of God and Satan, 
to cast that energy out. Little wonder is that energy leaves, it's rattling gates and things. It's just, but it's just energy. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, right. no, I get that because it was like that. That argument was heated, right? And 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 what you're saying that's a it, it's exactly like talking about casting out, just like the demon was cast into the pigs. Mm -hmm. Um, it, there was it, that hatred that we were feeling was cast out of us yeah. when we in the midst of that conversation. That's correct. But it it wasn't you know you weren't there weren't little demons running around poking right. It, it was. It was the mimetic energy that had developed. And you guys were also probably uh, bringing your mothers uh, uh, into this in your own heads. Right. Day. That's why I brought that into the story, yeah. because yeah. There, there's a whole back thing going on behind right. all that. So. Right. Yeah, I thought that was interesting because that's why I was inquiring about the pigs because of having had that experience, having witnessed something kind of similar, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I thought it was they went into pigs, this rattled trash cans, it went into the trash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's important we don't do what the liberals do, which is essentially to deny the the reality of, of evil. Um, oh, they'll, they'll acknowledge, yeah, the world's evil and stuff, but... But, but they don't really acknowledge it as something that can be, uh, that needs to be addressed and needs to be dealt with and can only really be dealt with by healthy people. I mean, I, I tell you, you know, you cannot, you cannot, quote, cast out a demon if you're not whole. Now, what prevents people today from casting out demons? Well, you go back to Luke. Remember when we did that that exercise in Luke, and I, I showed okay. in Luke ten how the disciples had been given the power to go out on a mission and overcome demons, and Jesus tells them, "When you go, you don't carry this, 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 this. You don't carry anything. You literally carry nothing, just your tunic." Right? They have to put down their defensive weapons. They can't even carry a knife. Right? Yeah. And then they come back, wow, we were casting out demons, man, right? Um, then, a little later, there's the story of the guy that comes and says, hey, I tried to get your disciples to cast out a demon. It's just, it's just at the end of the chapter. <laughs> and, uh, and they couldn't do it. Well, why couldn't they do it? Because what's the first thing they did when they got back from the mission trip? Oh, they were so excited. They put their purse on and they put their knife in their belt. and They, they went straight back into this world, as Jim puts it. They went back into this world, and they thus lost their power. If the devil's power is violence, you cannot overcome violence with violence. Satan doesn't cast out Satan. You can only overcome violence with love, forgiveness, peace, mercy, gentleness, kindness against these things. There's no law, and they they are the only things that work. Wow. So the, yeah. the Christianity today is plagued because it's it's all about, you know, your rights and your right to carry a gun. And, you know, you, you, you should be able to shoot and kill because there are bad people in the world. And, and you know, God doesn't like bad people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So Lauren told his story. I'm going to tell a story now. <laughs> it. It's not my story, but it's a story of a man that I, I have followed for years. And he tells a story of going, I don't remember what country it was, somewhere, and going to, you know, the backside of that country, you know, where white missionaries had never been before. Not quite that bad, but, you know, nonetheless. And... The uh, pastor of the church picks him up at the airport or wherever and tells him they have to immediately go to the church. And he's like, look, I've been traveling for hours. I'm tired. Just get me to the hotel. Uh, you know, I'm going to lay down. No, we have to go to church. No, I told you. I'm tired. Get me to the hotel. No, mm -hmm. we have to go there. Why do you insist we have to go to the church? Well, because there's witches and warlocks and shamans and whatever in this area. And every evangelist we've ever brought in, 
They cast spells on them, and two of them have died. Others have gotten violently sick, and so on and so forth. And so the whole church is down there, you know, and they're, they're, they've been fasting and praying for these meetings, and we need to anoint you with oil so that you're covered so that the demons can't get you. And he says, no, nah, no, nah, just take me to my hotel. I'll be fine. And so he's, he's in the hotel and taking his nap, gets up from his nap, and he starts uh, uh, spending some time praying and whatever, and he feels like the, the Lord tell, tells him or speaks to him and, and says something along the lines of, I'm going to show you um, deliverance ministry like you've never seen it before. <laughs> and he, he said he, uh, he immediately like, oh, God, please don't tell me that you know, that I've, I've got to go around casting out demons and yelling and screaming at them and binding them so they can't speak and, you know, pass out vomit buckets and whatever. <laughs> and so he gets to the meeting and he's preaching. And while he's preaching, every once in a while he'd see somebody sitting there in the audience that would just, they they would drop their head and Maybe close their eyes, maybe not. I'm not sure. I can't remember, but just drop their head. And he said a minute or two later, they'd pick their head up and they'd be just like, he could see it in their eyes. They were just like filled with light. And he, he was like, Lord, what what is this? What's going on? And he says, I sent my word and I healed them. The word is delivering people. And and I, I've, I've thought about that many times that because I know the word this man preaches, it's all about the love of God. It's all about who you are in Christ, in God. And and I, once again, I'm going to go back to what I was saying. As you know, and I think it's what you're saying too, Michael. Is as we begin to understand who we are as transformed people, as in Christ, as in God, people. We're set free from those old mindsets that demonized us, mm -hmm. if you, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a deliverance. It you know mm -hmm. it doesn't take. It's the word that brings that healing. It's mm -hmm. you know it's not a uh, exorcism, and and yet the same man, I've heard him say this. Look, if you need to go get the right brand of olive oil or wine or whatever and pour a bloodline all around your property and you need to paint olive oil crosses over the doorpost of, of all of your doors in your house in order to feel like you have spiritual victory in your house or the demons can't get there or whatever, then he says, go down to the store and get your wine and get your oil and do what you got to do, but it isn't the oil or the blood that did it. It's your belief. Mm -hmm. And if you believe you have to do this act in order to get it done, then do that act so that you can release your belief so that you can get your victory. Right. And, and, I, and I, think, I think that's what it is. I think if, if we need to have deliverance services, to help a person to see that they've been set free from this mindset of Satan uh, possessing or Satan having authority or messing up our day, uh, then have your deliverance service. But by the same token, you can just look into the word of God and see your authority and believe that, and it's in the word that you come to a whole different mindset. You no longer have the you have the mind of Christ. You no longer have the mind of Satan, where you know Jesus has to say, "Get behind me, Satan." You know. Um, so I, I just you know do what you feel you have to do, but the truth of the matter is, you have authority, and your authority. Um, puts you in a whole different perspective. It does not put you under the um, 
sometimes losing end of this spiritual warfare. Hmm. Yeah, um, that's why I find it interesting. I, that's why I like to share the story that I shared because we were 12 years old. You know, we, mm-hmm. we, we knew nothing. <laughs> we knew nothing other than we wanted to stay friends, you yeah. know. All right, guys, well, we're actually at time. Thanks, no everybody. Yeah, I know. I, I, when I looked a little <laughs> while ago, it was already at 45 and I couldn't believe it. Um, and now, now we're at an hour. Um, well, thanks everybody for listening. And uh, Jim, where can people find your book? On Amazon. All right. And Michael, you mentioned some of your materials. Where can people find that? Yeah. So what the Facebook uh, contains uh, um, a whole section in there on uh, uh, the Satan and evil and things like that. And then in um, the book, Understanding Spiritual Warfare, edited by James Bilby and Paul Eddy, uh, the responses by Walter Wink, uh, I wrote those, and so they can find that there. Um, We have so much more to discuss about this topic. I'm hoping we come back next week, we can flush it out some more. Um, But... um, I also, for those that are interested, there is a podcast online that I did with my friend Brad Jerzak uh, many years ago now uh, in a, on a show called Beyond the Box. And if you Google my name, Brad Jerzak, and put in the Satan or the devil or something, it'll pop up. And I, for, for me, for my money, um, it was probably the best experience I've had writing or talking about Satan uh, Brad, Brad brought some wonderful material to the table for our conversation, and I, I still uh, value that podcast very much, and and will listen to it from time to time because it was so unique, so uh, powerful. It was wonderful. Definitely check that out, everybody. And I, I know I've I've enjoyed Brad Jerzak as well. And I, I think mm-hmm. I've I think I've may have heard that podcast, Michael, because I remember one of them where you guys were talking together, um, yeah. or you both were on the same podcast. So, uh, but everybody, yeah, thanks. For, I, we've thanks. done a lot of things together, but I think that's that, that we've only done one or two podcasts together. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for tuning in. And I think we are going to continue this discussion again next week. See you next week.